Got a folk potty. Upward. Turn. Cut a folk potty. Rest on arms. Reverse. Body. Hold. Full. Out. Come on, party. Stand up. Ease. I now invite Major General David Gorn, MBE, the New Zealand Chief of Army, to deliver the call to remembrance. A century ago, Australia, New Zealand and Turkey were still at peace, unaware of the global conflagration about to bring our soldiers together in bitter conflict. In the years since, the legends of those soldiers of another age on these beaches and ridges that stand silent witness around us have shaped our nations. Those who landed knew they were on a momentous undertaking, but they had no inkling that their name would become legend. As we stand here in the peace and quiet of the early morning, we can cast our minds back to the morning 99 years ago when the soft sounds of waves on the shore and the gentle rhythmic splashing of oars of the landing boats were soon drowned out by the cacophony of gunfire the shouts of orders and the screams of wounded men. Now, almost a century, a century later, we come together to acknowledge the deeds of those who served in the Gallipoli campaign and to honour their memory and to reflect on all that they endured. There were great feats conducted here and there were those who straggled, who straggled those who stood by their mates, and a few who let them down. We should not judge from the distance of history, just as we cannot imagine the suffering and horrors endured by those who served here. Sergeant George Bollinger of the Wellington Infantry Battalion wrote in his diary, We moved into Quinn's Post at 8 o'clock this morning. In places, our trenches touched the Turks, and consequently, all trenches are made bomb-proof. One would never credit the miles of enemy divided by only a narrow bank of earth. Is it a wonder that men break down? The heat is intense. Flies swarm the trenches in millions. The stench from the bodies of our men lying on trenches in front is choking and nearly unbearable. The world outside has great confidence in the men, but I often wonder if they realize or try to realize what hell the firing line is and know that every man desires and cannot help desiring immediate peace. Bollinger survived Gallipoli only to die in France in 1917. Gallipoli has entered our vocabulary as the epitome of sacrifice and endeavor. For those who were there then, it was more a place of hardship, suffering and death. After the landing, Lieutenant Colonel Percival Fenwick from Christchurch wrote, 5,000 casualties, 
about three men per yard of ground gained. An order, to come out, uh, an order has come out naming this bay Anzac Bay after the New Zealand and Australian divisions. It does not matter what it's called. Perhaps it will someday be known as Bloody Beach Bay. God knows we have paid heavily for it. This then is a place of solemn remembrance of sadness and of loss. As dawn rises above the ridges, we think back to how it was that morning and to those who gave their lives to change our world forevermore. The first commemorative address will be delivered by Senator the Honourable Michael Ronaldson, the Australian Minister for Veterans Affairs, Minister assisting the Prime Minister for the Centenary of Anzac, Special Minister of State. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel. Can I also welcome those who have joined us this morning? In particular, I welcome uh, those young Australians and New Zealanders gathered uh, here today. Uh, you are our two nations' future, and we are justly proud of you. In the silence of this morning, in the eerie half-light of this new day, we should all pause and reflect upon those who were here 99 years ago and what their thoughts were as they landed on the shores below. We can only imagine what these men, the finest Australians and New Zealanders of their generation, saw as they, and felt as their boat, uh, as their boat uh, carried them from the safety of their homes and families to the heart of a global conflict. Five days after the landing, Colonel Stanley Price Weir, the commanding officer of the 10th Infantry Battalion from South Australia, described it in these words. Dawn was just breaking. 4.15am and no sound was heard except the splash of the oars. We thought that our landing was to be effected quite unopposed, but when our boats were within about 30 yards of the beach, a rifle was fired from the hill in front of us above the beach, right in front of where we were heading for almost immediately, heavy fire, rifle and machine gun fire was opened upon us. Friends, each day and dawn we now call Anzac Day, we gather to mourn, to reflect and remember those for whom the dawn of the 25th of April 1915 was to be their last. We who gather here today mourn those who made the supreme sacrifice in defence of values still held so dear. They answered their nation's call. They came from every corner of the, our two great nations to defend freedom. They were our nation's future, our farmers, our skilled tradesmen, our labourers, our artisans, our teachers, our writers, our stockmen, our doctors, our accountants, our leaders and statesmen, amongst many. Young men, strong and willing, brave and adventurous, plucked from the bosoms of their respective young nations. Their blood stains the cliffs of Gallipoli, the sands of Palestine, and the battlefields of the Western Front. In the smallest of towns and the largest of cities, they were mourned by loving mothers and proud fathers. We also remember those who were wounded, those who survived and the families left behind on the other side of the world waiting for news of the fate of their loved ones. The men who came ashore along this coastline 99 years ago were, by their own admission, ordinary men. They did not seek glory, nor did they want their actions to be glorified, for it was they who quickly came to know the true horror of war. That these ordinary men, however, did extraordinary things is beyond doubt. Here and across the world this morning, in Wellington and in Canberra, in France and the United Kingdom, 
in the smallest rural towns and in the biggest cities. Descendants of the Anzacs gathered to pay tribute to those who stormed this beach on the 25th of April 1915 and to pay tribute to those who have served over the last 99 years. And while the Anzacs left these shores as a vanquished fighting force, they were, however, victorious and helping forge the identity of our two new nations. And they introduced these new nations to the world. They fought on Gallipoli for eight long months. And after the campaign was over, 8,709 Australians and 2,721 New Zealanders lay dead in the hills and valleys that ring this place of commemoration or on the hospital ships at sea. Countless more Turks met a similar fate. The surviving Anzacs would leave here and go on to the Western Front and to Palestine to be part of the significant victories that helped create a fine tradition of service and sacrifice that continues to this day. Many of those who served on Gallipoli told these stories in their own words writing evocatively about what they had seen and endured. Their names and stories are recorded forever. The Ballarat Courier from my hometown printed the following letter penned by a soldier who had served on Gallipoli. And the letter said, I could write a book about the past four weeks. Landing on an open beach with 80 pounds on our backs, we flopped into the sea from barges 20 yards from the shore and up to our necks in water. The gear was thrown off and we charged up a cliff a hundred feet high with bayonets fixed. With the terrific roar of the naval fleet guns to cover our advance, you can imagine what a charge we had. But all day we were subjected to a hellish shrapnel fire. In this case, we don't know the identity of the soldier who wrote this letter he was described only as being formerly of Ballarat. But despite his anonymity, his memories of the Gallipoli campaign are no less real. As we reflect, reflect on the tragic loss of life at this place, and as the dawn of this new day breaks over at the peninsula, our tribute to the spirit of Anzac is a reverential silence. Lest we forget. The Turkish forces who opposed the Anzacs were led by Mustafa Kemal, the founder of modern Turkey, who as Mustafa Kemal Ataturk became Turkey's first president. I now invite Engineer Second Lieutenant Mehmet Akbash of the Turkish Army, who will read in Turkish the remarkable tribute paid to the Anzacs in 1934 by President Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. Teğmen Akbaş Değerli konuklar Şimdi sizlere Modern Türkiye Cumhuriyeti'nin kurucusu Ve Çanakkale kahramanı Mustafa Kemal Atatürk'ün Anzak annelerine hitaben göndermiş olduğu Duygu dolu Ve çok önemli mesajlar içeren mektubunu okuyacağım Bu memleketin toprakları üzerinde kanlarını döken kahramanlar Burada bir dost vatanın toprağındasınız. Huzur ve sükun içinde uyuyunuz. Sizler Mehmetçiklerle yan yana koyun koyunasınız. Uzak diyarlardan evlatlarını harbe gönderen analar. Gözyaşlarınızı dindiriniz. Evlatlarınız bizim bağrımızdadır. Huzur içindedirler ve huzur içinde rahat rahat uyuyacaklardır. Onlar bu toprakta canlarını verdikten sonra artık bizim evlatlarımız olmuşlardır. Arz ederim.
I now invite Engineer First Lieutenant Hukhan Sabanglia, also of the Turkish Army, who will provide the English translation of this wonderful tribute. First Lieutenant Sabancılar. Sir, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to read the letter, including full of sense and special messages, sent to be addressed to Anzac Mothers by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, founder of modern Turkish Republic and the hero of Çanakkale. Those heroes that shed their blood and lost their lives, you are now lying in the soil of a friendly country. Therefore, rest in peace. There is no difference between the Janis and the Mehmes to us, where they lie side by side here in this country of ours. You, the mothers, who sent their sons from faraway countries, wipe away your tears. Your sons are now lying in our bosom and are in peace. After having lost their lives on this land, they have become our sons as well. Thank you. Please stand and join the Gregory Terrace in All Hallows Gallipoli Choir in singing the hymn, Amazing Grace. Please be seated. 
The second commemorative address will be delivered by His Excellency, Lieutenant General, the Right Honourable Sir Jerry Mataparai, the Governor General of New Zealand. Tiho Moruora, e te tini me te mano e huhi nei ngā mihi mahana ki a koutou katoa. Tēnā koutou i tēnei karakia atatū o te rā o Anzac e mamau mahara ana i te pākanga tuatahi ki ka ripōria. Me ngā pākanga katoa o te ao. Kia ora hui hui tātou katoa. Uh, to the many people gathered here, warm greetings to you all. I greet you all at this dawn service on this Anzac Day as we remember the First World War at Gallipoli and all the wars where we have fought since. Greetings to you all. I specifically acknowledge Senator the Honourable Michael Ronaldson, Australia's Minister for Veteran Affairs and Minister assisting the Australian Prime Minister for the centenary of ANZAC and Special Minister of State. His Excellency Mr Hussein Kulazu, Deputy Governor of Chanakale, Dr Andrew Morrison MP, British Minister for International Security Strategy and the Prime Minister of the UK's Special Representative for the Centenary Commemorations of the First World War, the Honourable Michael Woodhouse, New Zealand's Minister for Veterans Affairs, Ambassadors, distinguished guests all, ladies and gentlemen. 100 years ago, Europe was heading into what has long been remembered as a golden summer. No one could have foreseen that summer's end would herald one of the darkest periods in our history. The First World War cast a long dark shadow and ripped our world apart. Now, remembrance ceremonies like this one bring us together. Each year, New Zealanders, Australians and Turks come from the four corners of the earth to this place where our grandfathers, great-grandfathers and great-great-grandfathers fought and where many, many of them died this morning we stand at the brink of the centenary of the First World War. At dawn, a year from now, those gathered here will look back to the start of the Gallipoli campaign. People's thoughts will rightly be focused on the events that unfolded exactly 100 years ago. They will imagine the Australian troops landing at Anzac Cove on a cold, crisp morning and the New Zealanders that followed in the heat of the afternoon. They will also contemplate the thoughts and deeds of the Turkish troops up on those hills who braced themselves to defend their homeland. This year, the 99th anniversary year, our thoughts, our reflections will likely be the same. However, in the space before the centenary begins, it is timely to remember the peace that was over this land 100 years ago as we honour those who fought and died here in 1915 and all of the servicemen and women who have answered the call since. In the words of the New Zealand historian Neil Atkinson, history is a responsibility we carry with us now and into the future. As the years pass, and new history is made. It is important we stop and remember the momentous events of our past. We do that not to glorify war, but to pay homage to the men and women who serve in them. They have served and some of them are currently serving, often very far from home, to defend our freedoms and to bring about a better peace for their families, for our families. The Anzac name and its meaning were born of those times, and every Anzac day we spare a thought for the Anzacs and the friendships that were forged on these battlefields 
at Gallipoli 99 years ago. After the war, our New Zealand Gallipoli veterans from New Zealand spoke warmly of their Australian mates. These words of Sergeant Harvey Johns are an example when he said they were good. You could depend on them. If they wanted anyone to back them up, it would be a New Zealander. And there were many other comments along similar lines. Unsentimental as was the nature of those men, but indicating a deeply felt respect and rapport. Australians and New Zealanders retain a special relationship and a confidence in each other to this day. Our histories, our peoples and our well-being are tightly interwoven. We continue to have close partnerships in security and defence, most recently in our near region in Timor-Leste and the Solomon Islands, and further afield in places like Afghanistan and the Sinai. Our Defence Forces continue to work together closely, especially in support of our neighbours in the Pacific. We also remember that we were not alone at Gallipoli. Many other countries, both the Allied and the Ottoman sides, lost men in that terrible campaign. For New Zealand and Australia, Gallipoli also shaped a new and profound relationship with Turkey. Once on opposite sides of the Gallipoli campaign, we have developed the greatest respect and affection for Turkey and its people. Every Anzac Day, the government and people of Turkey are our most considerate hosts. They allow the descendants of the first Anzacs the opportunity to remember our forebears' experience of war in the land where they served. For this, I thank you, the people of Turkey, on behalf of all New Zealanders here today, at home and around the world. This commemorative site at Anzac Cove was created as a collaborative venue between Turkey, Australia and New Zealand. The men who fought here could scarcely have imagined this in their future. And yet standing here today, we remember their examples and we know there can be hope even in the darkest of times. In New Zealand, we are proud to have a memorial on New Zealand soil to Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, the man who fought valiantly against us and then forged an enduring friendship. He was a leader in the art of peace and the art of nation building as much as he was in the art of war. This year we will also mark the 75th anniversary of the outbreak of the Second World War. Some of those who served in that war are still with us today and I want to take a moment to acknowledge those brave men and women and those too who were not on active service but nevertheless suffered the stresses and privations of wartime. Far away from here in Wellington, our national capital, a National War Memorial Park, Pukeahu, is being built to mark the centenary of the Anzac landings. I will have the honour of opening, opening Pukeahu next year. It will be a place to remember all who have served our country, and it will be a place where other nations that we share wartime experiences with may choose to also place a memorial. It is fitting that the first country to place a memorial at Pukeahu will be Australia. Our brothers in arms at Gallipoli. When we remember our brave forebears, we pay them the honour they deserve. It is also a time for reflection on war and its impact, and it is a chance to enlighten new generations about the events that shape their world and to encourage them to strive for peace. Looking out from where I stand this morning, it is very moving to see so many people assembled for this dawn service and to know Anzac Day services are taking place in many countries throughout the world. The scale of these commemorations show how deeply people have been affected by what happened here 99 years ago. On Anzac Day, we remember the suffering and loss of life at Gallipoli, and yet we celebrate the values that rose above the hardship hardship, comradeship, courage, compassion, loyalty and self-sacrifice for the greater good. And looking back, we know wars pass, but these values and the prospect 
of a better peace endure. Our being here on Anzac Day, this Anzac Day, keeps alive the torch of remembrance that has been passed on to us so that we can pass it on to our children and through them to their children. In this way, we ensure the service, the sacrifice and the hope of past generations is never forgotten. I will close by quoting the last frame of the Ode to the Fallen in Māori. I te hekenga atu o te rā, tainō ki te araranga mai i te ata, ka maumahara tonu tātou ki a rātou. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. I now invite Mr Simon Lewis, Secretary of the Australian Department of Veterans Affairs, to deliver a, a reading. Many of us have grown up with the stories of heroism displayed by the Anzacs the stoicism with which they bore hardships, the larrikinism which helped them endure in the face of horrors, and the way in which young nations came to be defined by what occurred here. Like all history, these stories are multifaceted and the full story was much more complex and layered. Nonetheless, the words of those who served here, written at the time, do tell of the most extraordinary acts being undertaken by those who simply did their jobs, did their duty as soldiers. The 16th Governor-General of Australia, Richard Casey, served here as a young officer with the Australian First Division. In his diary, he recounted a raid on the Turkish trenches on the 30th of May. He wrote, as to our fellows in the Turk trench, their progress was followed by the most remarkable series of bomb explosions and violent eruptions for over an hour. None of them came back, and I'm afraid none of them could have got out alive. It was a very sad, if wonderfully gallant sight to see those 20 or 30 men going to certain death with all the dash imaginable. I shall never forget that last man into the Turkish trench. He stood upon the Turkish parapet and threw bomb after bomb into the trench. Just as he was hurling the last one, he was knocked down by a dozen bullets and fell into the trench. Thus ended a very heavy battle and an unhappy piece of work. I cannot see what good these small individual attacks can do. Men get cut up and no apparent good comes of it. If a battalion had been pushed in, they could have done something. But what can 30 men do? I finished the day with a very great admir admiration for our fellows, but it does not tend to inspirit one. Today, almost a century later, we, we take this time to remember and honour those who fought here for our countries and those who gave their lives. Though we talk of futility, nobility, horror, loss and gain, and we may argue about the worldview of the time and what it meant, we are here in this special place to remember something greater, to remember the people rather than their purpose. This remembrance is not about glorifying war. It is rather about the acknowledgement of the true service and sacrifice of those who gave their all for their countries. This remembrance is something that we would forget or diminish at our peril. And should we diminish their memory, we would be left all the poorer. Words are often hollow, but some are not, lest we forget. Chaplain Lance Lucan, Principal Defence Chaplain, New Zealand Defence Force, and Chaplain Kevin Russell, Director General, Chaplaincy, Royal Australian Air Force, will now lead us in the prayer of remembrance and the Lord's Prayer.
Irunga iti ingoa, o te atua, o te matua, o te tama, o te waru o tapu amini. In a mana, in a reo, e rau rangatira ma, tina koto, tina koto, tina koto katoa. To all authorities, all voices, to the many chiefs gathered here, greetings, greetings, greetings to everyone. God of liberty and love, help us this day and in this place to remember the first Anzacs, both Australian and New Zealander, and the generations of people who have died in time of war. In this place, help us to remember those who bear the pain of war. Help us also to remember the widows, girlfriends, parents and orphans, and all those who waited in vain for the return of a loved one. We pray that we and all the people of our nations, gratefully remembering their sacrifice, may have the grace to live in a spirit of justice, of generosity, and of peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Wreaths will now be laid by our official representatives. To acknowledge the bond between Australia and New Zealand and the significance of the Anzac tradition, the first wreath will be laid jointly by His Excellency Lieutenant General, the Right Honourable Sir Jerry Mataparai, on behalf of the Government and people of New Zealand, and Senator the Honourable Michael Ronaldson, on behalf of the Government and people of Australia. The next wreath will be laid by Mr. Hussein Colozo on behalf of the government and the people of the Republic of Turkey. On behalf of the Federal Republic of Austria, the People's Republic of Bangladesh, Canada and the French Republic, His Excellency Mr. Klaus Wolfer, Brigadier General Mustafa Ahmed Saqib, Mr. Burke Thornton, General Ulrich Iristorza,
on behalf of the Federal Republic of Germany, the Hellenic Republic of Greece, Hungary and the Republic of India, Dr. Thomas Kurtz, Colonel Gregorius Bundliakis, Victor Matisse, General Shokin Chauhan. On behalf of Ireland, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan and the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, His Excellency Mr Kenneth Thompson, Captain Zakar Uriman and Dr Andrew Murison, MP. On behalf of the Defence Forces of New Zealand, Australia and the United Kingdom, Major General David Gorn, MBE, General David Hurley, AC, DSC and Air Chief Marshal Sir Stuart Peach, KCB, CBE, ADC. The final wreaths will be laid on behalf of the Commonwealth, Commonwealth War Graves Commission and New Zealand and Australian Veterans by Mr Kevin Jones, NP, Brigadier Rick Ottaway, MBE and Mr Robert Davenport. It is now time to reflect and to silently remember all of those who have served and died in war. Please stand for the ode, 
which will be followed by the last post, one minute silence and reveille. The ode will be recited by General David Hurley, AC, DSC, the Australian Chief of Defence Force. They went with songs to the battle. They were young, straight of limb, true of eye, steady and aglow. They were staunch to the end against odds uncounted. They fell with their faces to the foe. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them, lest we forget. General
Please remain standing for the national anthems of Turkey, New Zealand and Australia.
Um. I now, I now invite Chaplain Lance Lucan to offer a final blessing. And now for the benediction. Kainatinimati haere, haere moi mai rā i roto i tiriki. Rato ki rato, tato e tangi nei ki a tato, tena tato katoa. To the many that have passed on in this place, we bid you farewell. Rest in peace with the Lord. Bind those that have passed on. Bind those that lament their loss. We acknowledge you all. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Give honour to all. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Kayato mai ano kia kauto namanaki tanga ati atua rawa kaharawa ati matua ati tama ati waru tapu hari erunga iti ranga marie erunga iti aroha metinako hihiko kiti mahi kiti riki go now to love and serve all peoples go in the love of God go now. In peace. Amen. Please be seated. We began our service today with the mountain of the Catafalk Party, and now the Catafalk Party will be dismounted. Catafalk Party, in words, turn. Catafalk Party, quick. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our dawn service here at Gallipoli. Thank you.